So Ethan, um, I guess it's maybe a little bit awkward or, or, or prickly to, to, to criticize your colleagues, though I guess that's maybe par for the course. Uh, being a science communicator, people like Sabina Hassenfelder and Peter White also have earned their reputation from it. I've also earned some reputation for certain kinds of critical work that uh, overlaps with some of the work of Brian Keating, which is why I wanted to get your opinion, because I think we might have some interesting uh, overlap or talking points. So if you don't uh, mind me asking, could you summarize for us the content and motivation behind your critique of Brian's book? It appeared as an article in Big Think titled, Losing the Nobel Prize Makes a Good Point, But Misses a Great One. Yeah. Um, so uh, the short version for people who don't know, and by short version, it's still going to be a while. So stick with me. Um, back when we first discovered the expanding universe, when we first discovered that the farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster it appears to be receding from us, uh, we started wondering, well, what does this mean for the universe? Because in Einstein's theory of general relativity, if you have a universe that's roughly uniformly filled with stuff, right, on average, on the biggest scales, yeah, nearby, yeah, we're a big mass clump on planet Earth and, you know, a Earth radius away where there's nothing except the abyss of space, it's a pretty underdense region, uh, universe clumps into stars, planets, and also galaxies, and then these huge cosmic voids. But if I look on really big scale, scales of hundreds of millions, billions, or even tens of billions of light years at a go, it's really, really uniform. The universe on the biggest cosmic scales is uniform to about one part in something like 30,000, really uniform. Well, here's the thing. If you take a universe like ours, that's full of stuff uniformly, and you apply Einstein's equations to it, you find, uh-oh, this universe is not stable if it's stationary. The universe must either be expanding or contracting. And we said, okay, fine. So the universe is expanding because we observed it, right? The, the equations that you have basically tell you what the expansion rate squared is. So if you get a squared something equals this, when you take the square root, you could either get a positive or a negative value. And so you have to actually look to the universe to say, is it expanding or contracting? Uh, back then, people didn't believe this crap and they thought the universe would be static. So finding that the universe was expanding actually said, made us all say, oh, well, now the universe is expanding and we've measured it and it predicted it. And so that's it. So you say, okay, well, the universe is, the observable universe at least is this big now and things are expanding at this rate. So that means in the past it was smaller because it's expanding. So in the past it was smaller and denser and denser and denser and denser. And, you know, if you're mathematically inclined, like so many of us are who are physicists, you say, well, let's go all the way back. Let's go back, 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 expanding smaller, smaller, smaller. Let's go back arbitrarily far until... Pfft, you come all the way back to a singularity where all the matter and energy in space is collected into one single point. And we'll call that a singularity. And that's the birth of space and time. And that's where the universe came from. Great. Case closed. Cosmology is over. We can all go home. No. Right. So we started with this assumption. And then we started thinking about some puzzles. Right. If that were the origin story of our universe, then what would that imply? Well, it would imply a lot of things. One of them is that when we looked that way to the edge of the observable universe and that way to the edge of the observable universe, right? These two different ends, sure, we can see that and that way and we can see that and that way because their light since the Big Bang is only arriving at us now. But that means this region of space and this region of space never would have had time to talk to one another, to exchange information, to come to what we call thermal equilibrium, right? Thermal equilibrium is like what you have in your room where it's the winter and it's cold, so you turn on a heater in the corner. Does the whole room come up to temperature at the same rate? No. It doesn't. It takes time because you have a heat source in one place and the rest of the room is colder and the molecules have to collide and get heated up. And, and it takes a while for the whole room to heat up. Well, if you have something over there and something 
something over there and information can only travel at the speed of light, it's going to take some time for things in different regions to talk to each other. But we don't see that. We don't see, oh, on these big cosmic scales, this temperature and this temperature are unrelated. We find the universe has really uniformly the same temperature everywhere to, again, about one part in 30,000. That's weird. Another thing we see is that, hey, if we start off the universe, right, we have our hot big bang, everything in the universe, all the matter and energy in it is going to gravitate and work to pull everything back together. Meanwhile, you have an initial expansion rate that's going to start things off expanding. So the universe expands and gravity tries to recollapse it. What do you think is going to happen? Well, it turns out that unless you tune the matter and energy density and the expansion rate to perfectly balance each other, your universe is either going to expand so fast you can't even form protons and neutrons, much less neutral atoms, stars, and galaxies, or the universe is going to recollapse too fast for you to do any of this. Yet somehow, not only is this balance good enough for atoms and stars and galaxies and human beings to come into existence, even today, when we measure things as precisely as possible, it's like they're balanced on a knife edge. So why is that? But the big thing that's a kicker for me is all of our theories of physics tell us what we know, the standard model and all the particles in it can't be everything that's out there. There has to be some new physics for the universe to make sense at very high energies. And if you extrapolate the universe back to a singularity, you're going to get infinite temperatures, infinite energies. Where are all those exotic particles that have to exist that should have been produced? We don't see them or evidence for them anywhere in our universe. Uh, we call this the magnetic monopole problem. So that temperature problem, which is the horizon problem, the curvature balance problem, which we call the flatness problem, and the where are all my high energy relic problem, which is what we call the monopro monopole problem, named after the fact that all of these theories predict magnetic monopoles should exist and yet we don't see any in our universe, and we've done some really good searches now, right? It's 2023, and there's still no evidence for magnetic monopoles. So what happens? What's the solution? Well, in the late 1970s, a bunch of people independently were working on a possible set of solutions to this. And in 1980, uh, Alan Guth is generally credited with putting it all together. He realized uh, like others had worked on before him, including uh, Brout, including uh, Starobinsky. Uh, but what Guth's big advance was is he said, hey, if we had before everything gets hot and dense and full of matter and radiation, particles and antiparticles in that soup, uh, what if we had a period of exponential expansion where it was like there was energy inherent to empty space that dominated the expansion of the universe. Well, that would mean the expansion occurred at a non-changing rate, right? It was at a constant expansion rate. And what that means is things, after a certain amount of time, double their distance from one another. And then after that same amount of time goes by again, they'll again double their distance from one another and double again and double again. And you know, if you keep doubling things, they can get really big, really fast. That's what exponential expansion is. So if during inflation, the universe doubles in size every 10 to the minus 35 seconds, let's say, then after 10 to the minus 32 seconds, you've had a thousand doublings and that is enough to take something that was the Planck length, that's the smallest length that physics makes sense on, after a hundred doublings, now that thing is bigger than our entire observable universe is today. So inflation says, oh, I can solve these problems. You were wondering, why is the universe the same temperature everywhere, even in what we call these causally disconnected regions. And the answer, according to inflation, is, oh, well, they were all in the same region some time ago, and inflation stretched that region 
so large that now everything has that same property. If you come to the flatness problem and you say, hey, the curvature of the universe could have been anything. Like I can imagine a globe or I can imagine like a Pringle chip that has a curvature one way and then the other way in the opposite direction, like a horse's saddle in bite-sized format, right? You would say, oh, well, the universe could have had positive curvature like a sphere or negative curvature like a Pringle chip. But if you zoom in on it or you blow the sphere up to be enormous or you blow the Pringle chip up to be enormous, then that little part that you look at that represents the size of your universe, it's going to look flat. Even if it's not actually flat, it's going to be to you indistinguishable from flat. And finally, that third problem that where are all my high energy relics? Well, inflation says, yeah, we were inflating, 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 and then inflation came to an end. And when it does, all that energy that was inherent to empty space gets converted into particles and antiparticles and radiation and all of that good stuff. And that's an event we call cosmic reheating that comes at the end of inflation. As long as you don't reheat to too high of a temperature, and we now have observational limits that said at most that temperature could be about a factor of a thousand below the Planck scale. Um, as long as that temperature doesn't get too high, you're not going to produce those high energy relics anymore. So inflation not only solved those problems, uh, which led to it being like, ooh, a bunch of us are going to go work on this now because this is really interesting. Um, a bunch of people said, well, hey, if this is our new origin story for the universe, if this is what happened before the Big Bang started, then let's try and tease out some new predictions. If this inflation story is correct, yeah, that's great that we can reproduce all the old successes of the hot Big Bang. And it's great that we can explain some things that the Big Bang couldn't. But if we want this new theory to be accepted by everyone, we need to do that big thing that all new scientific theories have to do is I need to make a set of predictions that are different than the original theory's predictions. And we can go out and test them. So inflation had some of those. It said, okay, the big thing that I can do, I already talked to you about how we predict it to be flat because we have this exponentially expanding space. But what we have on top of that exponentially expanding space, because we have them everywhere and you can't get away from them, are these quantum fluctuations, right? The universe is quantum in nature and all the fields in it, even when there are no particles, all the fields fluctuate randomly. So what that means is, oh, well, maybe I'll get a positive energy or a negative energy fluctuation or a particle antiparticle fluctuation, right? I could get all these types of fluctuations. And when you get them, normally, right, they fluctuate and then they disappear back into the quantum vacuum. But in inflation, if they fluctuate while space is expanding, now they can't find each other because they're spatially separated. So as inflation continues, you get a spectrum of quantum fluctuations. And then on smaller scales, you have smaller fluctuations superimposed on top of the larger ones. And this continues for as long as inflation lasts. So inflation says, oh, well, I'm going to give you a whole new set of predictions. Number one, you're going to have an almost perfectly scale invariant, which means almost the same exact magnitude of fluctuation on all cosmic scales. So I'm going to see wherever these, wherever inflation occurred, I'm going to have little fluctuations and larger scale fluctuations and cosmic scale fluctuations. And I predict all of these fluctuations will be superimposed on top of on one another. Guess what? Those fluctuations, as we predicted back in the 80s, should appear imprinted in a few different places. Number one, they should be imprinted in the fluctuations in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. Number two, they should be imprinted in the fluctuations of matter that grow into galaxies and galaxy clusters. So if we look at how galaxies cluster throughout the universe, we should see evidence of, oh yeah, this spectrum of fluctuations exists and it exists with these properties that inflation predicts. It should be, for example, I'm gonna throw out some words that your readers aren't gonna, your listeners aren't gonna understand. These fluctuations should be 
adiabatic in nature, which means they should have constant entropy everywhere, as opposed to being isocurvature fluctuations or some other type of fluctuation. It means that these that the spectrum of fluctuation should be almost but not perfectly scale invariant, which means we should, when we see a fluctuation on small cosmic scales and one on large cosmic scales, they should be almost the exact same amplitude, but not quite. There should be just a slight tilt to it in one direction or another. Um, we should see, oh, in fact, when we look at the curvature of the universe, we should find that it's flat to within one part in somewhere between 10,000 and a million. Uh, we've measured it to be flat to about one part in a few hundred. So hopefully with new experiments, we can approach that. Um, and again, like we talked about, there should be that maximum temperature that your universe reheats to after the Big Bang that should be below the Planck scale. And we've confirmed that. So there were all of these predictions that have already been validated, borne out by inflation, specifically in the 2000s and the 2010s with the advent of the WMAP satellite, the Planck satellite, and large volume of the universe surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So all of those really made a very strong case for inflation that no other alternative could match. Which brings us all the way back to your original question. Right. What did Brian Keating say in his book, Losing the Nobel Prize? He went and asserted, oh, well, we have no evidence for inflation. We would like to have evidence for inflation. So let's look at a different type of fluctuations that were produced, not these density fluctuations that we've measured the crap out of. No, let's look instead for these tensor mode fluctuations or these fluctuations that occur in gravitational waves in the universe. Now, inflation predicts these, and it predicts exquisitely what sort of spectrum those fluctuations should have. But what it doesn't predict at all is what amplitude those fluctuations should be. We know what the spectrum should look like, but we don't know if that's something that is very strong fluctuations or intermediate size fluctuations or very, very, very small, maybe even unobservable fluctuations. So Brian's experiment, the BICEP experiment, one of its goals was to go and try and measure these fluctuations. They had a false detection, which was shown not to be true. And his book, Losing the Nobel Prize, was about oh, we would have won the Nobel Prize if this had turned out to be true, and I should have won the Nobel Prize, but I wasn't even being considered for it for some reason. And that's that's my story of losing the Nobel Prize. And while Brian rightly points out many, I would say, problems with how Nobel Prizes are awarded, who they reward and who they don't, um, the idea that oh, well, we won't know if inflation is true until we measure this, you know, fifth test of it versus the Big Bang. Like, no, you can't just ignore the evidence that other people have done before validating inflation. That is why your experiments got funded in the first place. If we hadn't seen that stuff, no one would be like, oh yeah, here's money, go build these detectors to go study these things. No, you're looking for something because we've already established Big Bang with inflation is more correct than Big Bang without inflation. Yeah, it's still worth looking for this signal, but also if you don't see this signal, which you might not, that doesn't tell you inflation is wrong. It just tells you the magnitude of these fluctuations is below the limit that your detector is sensitive to. So those were my big issues with Brian's interpretation of the story, because we have really good inf information about cosmic inflation, where our universe came from, and how it got to be the way it is today. And you don't want to ignore that information just in service of telling a story that makes your contribution to science sound more important than it actually is in the full context of the story. Oh, interesting. Um, it's it. Uh, how I say? It, it, you, you said a lot, but let, let me just pick one 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 aspect of what you just said. Is it is it is it even accurate 
to say that he lost the Nobel Prize? Like, so suppose suppose the team did not get their results invalidated, uh, given the large press release around the event. Um, it sounded like there would have been Nobel Prizes, but it, but so there's that question, and then the second is, uh, uh, nevertheless, if there if there were to be a Nobel Prize, it would have been one, I guess, of a six in a succession of great discoveries, maybe even Nobel Prizes of past inflation results. Is that, is that correct? I, I don't know. So so one thing that's important to say is no one has ever won a Nobel Prize for cosmic inflation. That Nobel Prize has not been awarded. So the big question is, if we're ever going to award one, what will be the discovery that we say is worth it for? And then who do we split the prize between? Because the Nobel Prize, and this is something that Brian does correctly point out in his book, uh, is cannot be awarded to collaborations or teams. It can only be awarded to individuals and it can only be shared between a maximum of three individuals. So who wins the Nobel Prize and who doesn't, right? When we discovered the accelerated expansion of the universe, right? Dark energy from supernovae, who won the Nobel Prize for that? Well, it was Adam Reese and Saul Perlmutter and Brian Schmidt. Does that mean that Nick Sunsev didn't deserve the Nobel Prize for his work on it? Does that mean there were hundreds of scientists who worked on those teams, but you got to pick three. Uh, who deserved the Nobel Prize for gravitational waves? Well, they gave it to three. They gave it to Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne and Barry Barish. But they could have given it to David Reitze, who was the executive director of LIGO. They could have given it to, like, there were all sorts of other people who played major roles, who did incredibly important contributions, who wouldn't be considered of it. Well, if you give a Nobel Prize for the detection of gravitational waves from inflation, who do you give it to? Do you give it to Alan Guth, who first put forth the theory of inflation? Do you give it to Andre Linde, who was um, arguably the second most influential theorist of inflation, who discovered the graceful exit problem solution, who put forth the idea of chaotic inflation? Um, do you give it to Andy Albrecht or Paul Steinhardt, who made key early contributions? Do you give it to Bruce Allen, who, to my knowledge, in 1987, made the first prediction of the gravitational wave spectrum that would arise from inflation that his experiment would have detected? And then when you talk about, well, if the BICEP collaboration did Nobel Prize-worthy work, who from that collaboration to, gets it? Brian thinks it should have been him because it was his detectors and his detector scheme. But Brian wasn't the PI of the project. I think he writes at length about how uh, Jamie Bach, another scientist, was kind of a little bit of a glory hog about that. Um, I seriously doubt that Brian Keating's name would have even been among those considered for being awarded that Nobel Prize had it held up. But there's only three. It's not that experiment. And so we'll never know. But um, the, the thing that I want people to take away from that is not like, oh, well, Brian's self-importantizing himself more than he's worth. No, I, I want them to take away, look, Make no mistake, the Nobel Prize system is broken because that is not how science works. It's not like you have one or two or three genius scientists in isolation making all these discoveries by themselves. These are teams of hundreds or of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of people all working together to pool their efforts together to make these monumental discoveries possible. And yes, if we feel better about ourselves because we're picking out individuals and elevating them and people can feel like, yeah, that's my hero, that's who I wanna be like, and some people need that, fine, but recognize that you're doing that. Recognize that you're overlooking 99% of the people who contributed to this being the scientific discovery that it was. The BICEP collaboration has grown and expanded. There are many other cosmic microwave background experiments that are comparable, like Polar Bear, like ACT, like CMB Paul, like there are many others. They're all doing the same thing. They're all trying to measure the microwave sky of the universe, which encodes 
a lot of very, very early signals to very high precision. They're looking at these tiny temperature imperfections and their polarizations and how the light arrives and what properties it has to try and infer, well, based on what we see, what was the very, very early universe like? And what has happened to that light from the moment it was released 380,000 years after the Big Bang over the next 13.8 billion years before it arrived at our eyes? These are not questions that one or two or three people have figured out and deserve a Nobel Prize for. These are things that it took the whole army of physicists working on this subfield of astrophysics to figure it out observationally and theoretically combined with novel instruments that were built explicitly for the purpose of studying these things. Great. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, explanation and, and insights in, into this story. I obviously uh, learned a lot not, not being an astrophysicist myself. Um, I want to get back to this uh, issue of theories of everything that Brian Keating got interested in, because I think there's some interesting parallels with that, uh, with the losing the Nobel Prize story. 